Right. It's already seven o'clock. Sorry, I came right on the dots. Uh, but I'm a little bit earlier to let's catch up, but yeah, I think we can start right away. Uh, and then the, the other players can join in uh, when they um, when they get the chance to, to come. Uh, so today we are going to be working on uh, the isolated queen spawn and its uh, advantages and disadvantages. And I don't know if you guys have seen uh, the lesson notes. I'm going to just quickly grab. Um, okay, there we go. I open the study. And we can uh, sort of start from there. Okay. All right. So these are the lesson notes. Um, so in this lesson, the lesson goes, this is what I have in mind for uh, you guys to learn here tonight. Number one, how to play with an isolated pawn. And number two, uh, how to play against an isolated pawn. So what you should already know before this lesson, like knowing this will definitely give you the confidence that you are going to uh, only add to what you know uh, and uh, understand this topic a little bit more. So first of all, the first question, yeah, you can unmute or raise hand. Uh, what is an isolated pawn? Um, that's a pawn that has uh, no other pawns uh, on the files next to it. Yes. A pawn that is no other pawns on the files next to it. That is correct. Uh, what is the weak pawn? So, Anna Zion said... A pawn that has no protection. Okay, welcome, uh, Hannah, Zion. Uh, well, yeah, a pawn that has no protection, but no protection from what exactly? There's a specific thing that I want you to answer there that uh, I'm looking for. Sure, it's a pawn uh, that doesn't have protection, but protection from what? From another pawn. That is correct. Thank you, uh, Rowan. So the correct definition of a weak pawn is a pawn that cannot be protected by another pawn. That is the textbook meaning of what an ice, uh, a weak pawn is. A pawn that cannot be defended by another pawn. All right. So I think Rowan and uh, Anna have participated. Let's hear from Siam Tanda. What is a weak pawn structure? Yes, Siam Tanda, what is a weak pawn structure? Um, Siam Tanda, are you with us? Okay, well, Siam Tanda, Terry's Michael, you can also help us. Uh, what is a weak pawn structure? Presume are we for referring to pawn islands here? So uh, you generally want your pawns connected so you can have them protecting each other. Whereas if they split up into like three islands, it's harder to defend them. Yeah, no, that's a good assumption. It does cover something about weak pawns. Uh, all right. So now, uh, what you should get out of the lesson? The first thing, the benefits of playing with an isolated pawn. Uh, so we are going to look at the benefits of playing with an isolated pawn, the disadvantage of playing with an isolated pawn, but really I should have done the order the other way around. Because normally you want to see why something is bad, and then you appreciate the good, the good news later. So I'll change the order around here, actually, so that we start with number two instead of number one. Yeah, only in the chess lesson, not in the, in the men's room. They won't allow you to start with two before one. Right. 
Okay, so we are going to start with the disadvantages first, because we need to first see uh, why uh, it is bad to have an isolated queen spawn. But just a, a quick historical background on this very fascinating discussion of an isolated queen spawn. Many, many top chess players over the years have many things to say about the IQP, as it is famously coined in chess circles, IQP, isolated queen spawn. Some players say it is bad. Some players say it is good. So there is no agreement there. It is really uh, sort of 50-50. There are very st strong statements said by some players uh, or whether on that it's good and then strong statements that it, uh, it's bad. So uh, this is some of the things um, involved with an, uh, with an isolated uh, queen spawn. And one of the players, uh, if you will, one of the main theoreticians uh, in the chess world, particularly in the 19th and 20th century, uh, Aaron Nimzovich said that the isolated queen spawn is uh, really one of the chief discussions in chess, especially when it comes to positional chess. Right, so let us look at some of the disadvantages of uh, the IQP. So we are going to first start looking at playing against it. All right, so we'll flip the board. Well, we are going to watch from the person who won. So playing against an isolated pawn is strategically straightforward, right? Now, this is the statement that the author of this book, this is Atta Yusupov in Build Up Your Chess 3, comes up with. It's apparently strategically straightforward. Now, let us see if this is a true statement. So I'll ask questions. What is the strategy that you should use when you are playing against an isolated queen spawn? Uh, try and tie down your opponent's pieces to protecting it. Okay, that's one thing. Try to tie down the opponent's pieces to defend the pawn. Okay. Uh, who else has a suggestion or a comment? What strategy should you use when your opponent has an IQP? Okay, we have. Uh, Bruza Wempolo, welcome. So we are just covering the topic of isolated queen spawn, the advantages and the disadvantages. So we are going to first look at the disadvantages first, so that it, it really gives us a picture. So I'm asking the question, uh, what is the strategy that you should use when someone has an isolated pawn? How should you play against the isolated queen spawn. So Rowan has given a suggestion uh, that you should force your opponent's pieces to be tied down to defending the pawn. Uh, come on, guys. Uh, if no one raise hands or unmute, I'll pick people because we tried. This session has to be interactive. We need to discuss our thoughts. Now tell me what you are thinking. We also want to control the square in front of the pawn to stop it from moving. Very good. All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, who else says the suggestion? One more person and then we'll continue. Okay. Uh, Siam Tanda, what strategy should you use against an isolated queen spawn? By the way, is Sam Tender online? I've asked uh, you to speak a few times, but you have not said anything. Well, if your audio is not working, you can use the chat. You can type something in the chat. Please make it known that you are there. Right, okay. Uh, if Sam Tender, there is, I see a few more people are coming in. Clayton Macheka, Luciano, welcome everyone. Um, right, so uh, to the new uh, 
people that have arrived, we are covering the topic of Israel Queen's Pawn. So we are going to first look at how should you play against the isolated Queen's Pawn. So the question that I've given out is what strategy should you use when someone has an isolated Queen's Pawn? So uh, Rowan said you should force the opponent's pieces to be tied down to defend that pawn. Uh, Michael said you should control the square in front of the isolated Queen's Pawn. What else do we think we should do? Uh, one more person, Clayton, why, what should you do when someone has an isolated Queen's Pawn? Block the pawn from moving. Block the pawn from moving. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, so now the one of the weaknesses of the isolated queen's pawn is that when you simplify the position, it can become a, a weakness because there are less pieces on the board. Uh, so that's one of the things uh, that you should um, always consider. Uh, Brooklyn, please uh, unmute yourself. The side which is playing against an isolated queen's pawn must try to simplify the position and make the transition, or in other words, go for a favorable end game. So when you are playing against an isolated queen's pawn, you are trying to simplify and go to an end game where you might have an advantage. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that exchanging all the pieces uh, without even considering what will happen is going to give you an advantage uh, because this is really the biggest debate. Some, now, I think the, the modern debate says even end games of isolated queen spawn are not as dangerous as they once were thought to be. But this has been the main plan for many years to simplify the pieces. So, uh, so the first thing that has been raised uh, by Clayton and Michael, the square in front of the isolated pawn. Uh, Richard Retty, very famous chess player in the 19th and 20th century, one of the modern chess thinkers uh, who is famously known with this first move, uh, the Retty opening or the Retty system that starts with one knight to f3. So he said that the most important thing about the isolated queen's pawn is the square in front of it. So first of all, I must just raise the point that any other pawn is usually uh, weak. I'll give a diagram. If, an, if a pawn is isolated, usually it's just a weakness. Uh, if it's an isolated pawn in any other position, it's usually a weakness. It's, sorry, <laughs> that's supposed to be a king, not a rook. Okay, so usually any other, uh, at any part of the game, if you have an isolated pawn, it's usually a weakness. This is an isolated pawn. By the way, for those who came late, this is the structure of the lesson. First of all, what you should get out of this lesson or the lesson course, this is what I have in mind for you to learn or to learn more about how to play uh, with the isolated pawn, number one. Number two, how to play against uh, an isolated pawn. So what you should already know, what is an isolated pawn? It is a pawn that is separated from other pawns. There is no pawns of the same color standing next to it. Uh, what is a weak pawn? A weak pawn is a pawn that cannot be defended by the pawns of the same color. That's a weak pawn. Uh, what is a weak pawn structure? Is when you have doubled pawns, when you have isolated pawns when you have pawn islands the pawns are split up the structure is broken apart and the pawns are very weak the pawns cannot defend each other pawns must stay connected they must always try to uh, stay together and defending each other and uh, what you should get out of the lesson the benefits of playing with an isolated pawn number one breakthrough in the center this is the plan that we are going to learn when we focus on attacking attacking on the king's side, attacking on the queen's side. And number two, this is what we are focusing on first of all. Controlling the square in front of the isolated pawn, direct attack of the isolated pawn, change in the pawn structure. 
So we are focusing on the disadvantage first. We need to see why it is bad, first of all. Then we'll only go to the first thing. Now, in this position, black just has an isolated pawn. When white plays this move, or for instance, actually it should not be white to move, it should be black to move. Black has to defend this pawn with their pieces. This is an isolated pawn. The black rook must move here and white can just come and sit with his rook and block this pawn from moving. And the plan would be to go knight d4, knight to c6 and attacking this pawn. Of course, the king will be activated since it's the end game and black has a clear disadvantage because of this pawn. So any other isolated pawn is usually weak. But of course, if this pawn can move up the board, if it goes up the board, it is now an ice, uh, outside pass pawn. So it's now a, a pass pawn that is very far advanced. But when it's stuck on its own side of the board, it's a weakness because it's going to be attacked. Uh, and the pieces must defend uh, the weak pawn. And by the way, this is why it is important not to weaken your pawns. When you weaken your pawns, this pawn cannot be defended by another black pawn. This means the knight and the rook have to do a job that is less than. Because what is the price of the pawn on a7? What is the price of the pawn in general? Anyone? What is the price of the pawn in chess? Quickly, we need to move fast because of time. What is the price of the pawn? One. One point. One point, right? One point, correct. And what is the price of the rook and the knight? That's eight. Yes, all together yeah, it's yeah. eight. But the rook yeah, is rook five. Is five and the knight, knight is three. three. So when your rook, which is five, has to defend one, that is what we call a passive piece. I'm sure you've heard the word passive in chess. A passive piece is, what, is a piece that is doing a job that is less than it is uh, prized at. The rook is five points. It should be on an open file on the seventh rank and causing problems. But the rook has to play babysitting job. This is a passive piece. Uh, it is doing a less than job. So hopefully this diagram will put a picture in your head don't weaken your pawns. Right, let's continue. Now we are going to see uh, the, the different plans as, as it has been laid out. The square of the isolated pawn, we absolutely must control the square in front of the isolated pawn. The pieces are blockading, are blo are blockading an isolated pawn who have central squares and all of that. All these words will be explained with diagrams, don't be confused especially the knight is the best piece to block an isolated pawn with. Uh, we'll see this quickly in the game. So let us start then right away. We need to move. So the game was played between uh, Ata Bisgia and Anatoly Kapov. Quickly, who is Anatoly Kapov? Someone? The former world champ. Very good, Brooklyn. Uh, Anatoly Kapov is a former world champion from Russia. Uh, he was the 12th world chess champion. Uh, very strong chess player and very good strategy. Uh, and here he was playing against Arthur Biskia. Uh, if that's how you say his last name. So this game was played in Yugoslavia in 1972. All right. And this was round 12. So this is towards the end of the tournament. So this is an important game. Usually towards the end of a tournament, this is where the prizes are now being uh, determined. Someone must win. Uh, so they play a very uh, clear, now it is clear that there's going to be some, there's, there's some problems here. These pawns are looking at each other. So as soon as white takes, white is going to end up with an isolated prince pawn. Right, so after knight to c6, uh, h3, everyone is following the basics of the opening, which is to control the center, develop your pieces quickly towards the center, and connect the rooks afterwards. You go into the end, uh, mid game. And now finally, Kapov makes it clear he wants to play the mid game where the opponent has an isolated queen's pawn. 
Now, this is the only isolated queen spawn that can cause problems for us. Like I said with this example, any other isolated pawn is usually a weakness for the most part because it is going, it, it doesn't really threaten that much. But this one is a little bit different. It is special, as you can see, uh, all these examples in that. And now the first plan we are going to look at is controlling the square in front of the isolated pawn. There is, there is a saying in chess, weaknesses must be fixed. Uh, who wants to tell me what that means? Quickly, someone? It means if you, if you find a weakness, you need to make it permanent so that it will always be there. Very good. Correct. It is easy to attack a weakness that can't move. For instance, in this example, why to fix this pawn? The pawn on a7 cannot go anywhere because we know the rules of the pawn. The pawn can't move if something is in front of it. Now this pawn cannot run away. We have a fixed target. It is a target that we can bring our pieces to attack easily because it can't move anywhere. But if the target can move, if this pawn, say white plays a, uh, a strange move, uh, white plays a strange move like this. This pawn is a moving target. And when it is moving, it can become problematic because now if this pawn gets close to white, now it is even a dangerous pawn. But if white blocks it by playing correctly, fixing the pawn, it remains a very serious weakness. The plan is to bring the knight to c6 and win the pawn, right? Uh, so weaknesses must be fixed. So this is the one plan with an isolated queen pawn to block the square in front of it. So let's move fast. Okay, so now, of course, there's lots and lots of arrows here. <laughs> uh, but the plan is to make sure the square under in front of the pass pawn, the isolated queen pawn is blocked. The pawn can't move forward. If it moves forward, it's going to be taken. The square is attacked by four of black species. The pawn on d4 is going nowhere anytime soon. All right. So I may need uh, some, right, okay. We are on move number 14. Okay, takes, takes. Now we have said that one of the plans against the isolated queen's pawn is to simplify, which just means exchange pieces. So normally when pieces are being exchanged, it favors the person who's playing against the isolated queen's pawn because they are going to be less pieces to defend this pawn. It will become more of a weakness, the more pieces that come off the board. Right, so, okay, so Rook goes here. And all right, so it is your turn to play here. You are playing with the black pieces. Uh, because there's a number of people now, let's try at least to raise a hand. If you don't know how to raise a hand, just go to the reactions there. You will see the option to raise a hand so that we don't speak at the same time. So if you think you have a move, raise a hand. You, you get one point for the correct guess and two points, two or three points, no, one or two points for the right reason. Clayton? Yes, go ahead. Knight d5. Knight d5. Okay, that's one point. Why do you say knight d5? Because one exchange one of the defenders of the d5 square. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Hannah? Um, how about knight e4? Knight e4. Yes. Okay, now there's an important question in chess. You must always ask this, please listen carefully now. Before you make a move, find out why is my move a blunder? So I'll ask you that question. Is knight e4 a blunder? Yes. So why is it a blunder? Knight takes e4 on c. 
that is correct right okay Anna, thanks thanks for trying okay so in the game uh, mr kapov played rook g6 uh black develops a strong pressure against the pawn uh black is just putting all of their pieces in, uh, to attack the square is currently blocked clayton your move knight d5 wasn't bad it blocks but maybe it would exchange too many pieces uh so uh, and for now black wants to put pressure on this pawn after rook d6 queen to e3 rook c to d8 a3 bishop to b3 attacking the uh, attacking the rook on d1 the rook goes to d2 and rook e6 attacking the queen. Now, as we can clearly see, black has an advantage here. Black completely dominates the square in front of the isolated pawn. Black has more active pieces. The pieces are attacking and defending better than white's pieces. White's rook is still asleep. It hasn't come into the game. So clearly, white has not followed the right plans for someone with an isolated pawn. Black is currently uh, playing better here. So after, uh, where are we? Queen to f4, knight to d5 was played. Now we put a piece in front of the pawn. Black wants to simplify the position so that the end game is going to be good for him. So this is the plan uh, that Mr. Karpov was following. So after knight d5, knight takes d5 and rook takes d5. I'm not sure how many of you have seen positions where rooks are like this in the middle game. Uh, right. Yes. So, sorry, sir. Yes, Brooklyn. Could it, what if black played? What if black captured with the bishop instead? Yeah, black can capture with the bishop. But the only thing you need to ask is that why do you want to capture the bishop? Like the knight, the knight on f3 is defending the rook. So if you capture the knight and then attack the queen, you can you can capture the rook with the queen. Okay, so you are thinking tactics, right? You want to take them, but the point is because your bishop is not there anymore. Now this rook that was out of the game can come into the game. So do you see that? Okay, yes, I can I add a little yes. bit more to this. Um, if you take uh, with the bishop takes the knight, and when he recaptures with his bishop, he'll have control over the b uh, five square, and you lose control. And as well, the rook is defended by the queen. Actually, I didn't see this. You, your queen can't take on g two if this bishop takes. The rook is defended twice by the queen and the knight. But more than anything, as we have learned, Karpov was a strategical player. And players who play with strategy want to keep your pieces doing nothing. So this bishop is doing a very good job by keeping this rook out of the game. And as well, removing a defender to come to the d4 pawn. So rook d5 was taken with also rook lift. The rook have no open file except this one but the rook can be lifted into the game and play an active role. So g4, probably stopping rook f5. And now it's actually white who's under attack because the rooks are very active on the third and the fourth rank. This is called a rook lift. When you move the rook up the file, up a file and to bring it to across the rank, this is called a rook lift. And now uh, these rooks are very active. White species are absolutely terrible. And now that threat that you had in mind, Brooklyn, is on the board. The threat is to play rook f3 now, winning the, the rook. So the opponent instead played bishop to b3, noticing that if you take, takes, uh, takes, there's bishop takes, and you know all of that, you might be in trouble because your king is going to be attacked there. So, uh, so, so you need to, sorry, can I add in? Uh, yes. Rook takes f3, queen takes f3, and queen takes d2. Queen takes um, oh, d5. Uh, d5. Correct. Correct. Our rook will be hanging as well. So that's why it doesn't work. Thanks, Rowan. So bishop c, b, uh, c4, b3, 
bishop moves to a6. And let's just check what move if this is. Move number 25. Right, so b4, attacking the queen. Now, what would you play here if you are playing black? Black has done a successful strategy. This pawn has been blocked, which we wanted to do. White got no play for this pawn. Uh, it's been black all along. So black clearly has an advantage. After this move, b4, what would you play? Again, go to the reactions and raise hand. I thought that you. Yes, Brooklyn. Oh, see, I'm Tanda. Brooklyn, you can uh, go first. I don't know if this is right, but uh, knight takes before. Okay. Knight takes before. And then let's yeah. follow the line. Knight takes b4, bishop to b3. So you didn't think of bishop b3, it seems. Yeah, I didn't see bishop b3. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, it's a pawn. A pawn is a pawn, it's a pawn, it's a pawn. That's what strategy tells us. A pawn is a pawn. Uh, but yeah, it was too little advantage for Kapov. He didn't want to go for this. It gives White a counterplay. White is at least some some life in the game. Okay, uh, see, I'm done. That you had something to say? See, I'm done. That. Oh, okay, maybe you wanted to say the same thing. Okay. Uh, so in the game, instead, he played queen to d8. Continue to put pressure on that pawn. There is no need to rush. Uh, the opponent has nothing to do. When your opponent doesn't have anything to do, don't make their life easy. Continue to apply pressure. That is number one. Uh, so the queen goes to d8. And now, bishop to b3. The bishop is attacking our rook. So what would you play now here? You can raise hand. So if you have a move, be ready to explain why. Okay, Hannah. Yes, Hannah, your hand was raised first. Um, is it fine if you could go... How about if you could go knight takes d4, then if the bishop takes, you can take the knight on f3 with a fork on with the king and the rook. The queen. D. If the queen takes, then this rook on f will take that. Will take the queen. Okay, very good. Uh, good uh, guess and also good explanation. Some calculation there. Thanks. I think that was Jethro, is it? Okay, Clayton. Yeah, I had the same idea. All right, all right. Uh, Rowan? I have a similar idea, but I was thinking uh, if rook takes f3 first, then after queen takes, knight takes uh, d4, it hits the queen and the bishop. Uh, so if he moves his queen, you, you take... Um, the bishop with your knight and it's actually two pieces for the rook but if he recaptures your knight with the queen you can capture on d2 yes and if you take the uh, bishop on uh b3 you're hitting both rooks with the knight hmm. yeah no that's correct uh i might not have followed the rest of the lines but i think yeah the right move while i was played was knight takes d4 black wins the pawn without giving any counterplay. Black just wins a pawn here. Uh, because of course, as for reasons that have been said, knight takes, the point is this. I'm not sure someone raised this line. Um, because the, the bishop can move back, but the problem is the bishop is pinned 
And here we have just won a pawn. Black hasn't lost any, white hasn't lost too much material. We have just won a pawn, but, uh, well, in fact, yeah, we have won a pawn. So white has an advantage and also an active queen. So that is the point. Uh, in the game, the opponent played rook takes d4 instead, which is given a question mark and an exclamation mark, which is a dubious move. So in the uh, cup of played rook takes d4, knight takes g5. So the opponent sacrificed the exchange to try and attack somehow, to come up with some counterplay. Uh, but the game was so shortly lost after uh, rook d3, making a double attack, attacking the queen and the bishop. And after rook d3, queen h4, threatening some cheap tricks here. So you must watch it. Don't always ask what does the opponent want to do after every move. So stop the threats of the opponent first. Uh, and now, yeah. Why was rook h6 a mistake here? Who would like to say? Why was rook h6 a mistake? Because it looks like a threat. It's attacking the queen, but why was it a mistake? Okay, Clayton. Okay, I think Hannah, Hagai, and Jethro, who wants to speak? Um, Hagai. Okay, In Hagai. Rook h6 is played. The knight jumps to e6, 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 whereas the... The knight can jump to e6. Yeah, but the knight jumping to e6 doesn't do anything. It loses a piece, no? Uh, but a good I said rook takes h6. After rook h6, queen takes h6, king takes h6, and then knight takes f7 check. Correct. The fourth. That's correct. So I think that's Clayton. So yeah, this was the problem. If you try to attack, yeah, you must always calculate, even when you are winning, don't get excited. It's not over in chess until you get the resign resignation or checkmate. Never relax. Now, actually, black is, uh, white is back in the game. And it is even white who's up with material. Right. So don't be careless when you get an advantage. Always make sure you make the most important move, which stops the counterplay. H6 was played. The opponent tried knight to F7. And after... Queen to d4, rook e1, and rook h3. Rook h3 and white had to resign. So why does white have to resign? What? Rook h3? This looks yeah, like it's queen losing. Takes, okay. uh, queen That's takes f2, point. yeah. That's the point. So it's removing the defender, right? So the queen is defending f2. So takes, now if the queen can't stay here defending f2 anymore, it has to take, and after this, check. The king must go here, check, and yeah, the game will soon be lost. Yeah. I mean, there's many ways to win. We can even just take here and then be annoying and just go to the end game. Why make it complicated? Right, rook check, and then now we are attacking uh, the king and picking up a free bishop, and the game is lost. All right, so that was the first plan with uh, block the pawn when someone has an isolated pawn. These ones will go a little bit qu uh, quicker. We just have to go to the key moments, which I think in this game, uh, the key moment is on move 11. So this game was played by Atta Yusupov, uh, who was a student of the famous chess coach, Mark Dvoretsky, uh, who's since passed away, but Mark Dvoretsky was, uh, many people say he's the greatest chess coach that they ever lived. Uh, and now, Atta Yusupov was a very top chess player himself, was in the top 10 of the world, uh, and played in the candidates tournament to determine the challenger for all champion. And now he's also a very strong chess uh, trainer as well. Uh, but he's not a He's not a slouch, he's a top player. Uh, so after this, bishop to e2, now we see the position right away. We have a 
isolated queen's pawn. Now it is black this time who has an isolated queen's pawn. And the plan we are going to be looking at is to, uh, we, the first one was this one. Let's re remind us, us, let's remind us what we are doing. So we first looked at controlling the square in front of the isolated pawn, which was done very well by Mr. Kapov. And then uh, we are now going to look at this point, direct attack of the isolated pawn, meaning exactly what it says, try to attack the pawn. Right? So that's what we are going to try and see here. Let's see how uh, Mr. Yusupov did that. Uh, so after this, the pressure is on right away. We are threatening to take on d5, but of course, there is a cheap trick. We can't do it right away because there will be uh, some pain coming along very soon. For those who don't know, let me just show you. Uh, for those who play the French defense, I know Michael uh, is a French defense uh, player or has played against the French. I'm not sure, but I suspect he knows this line. But pretty much most people should know this now. Uh, this you don't want to happen, of course, yeah? This is an embarrassing way to lose your queen. Now, when we say play for a direct attack against the pawn, don't just do these plans. By the way, this is a, a good rule of thumb. When you learn strategy, don't do strategy without looking at tactics. Strategy must always respect tactics. Even if you follow good strategy, but if the tactics don't allow you you are going to lose many games. So this is important for all of us to remember. Strategy can only work when tactics don't uh, destroy our plan. So any plan that is good, it might even follow the rules. But if it's a plan that is going to be stopped by tactics, we need to change the plan. So of course, night was night took here, but we are happy with this because we are the one attacking. So when the opponent simplifies or in other words exchanges pieces we are happy to see this and now we have three attacking pieces against one defending piece and now of course the opponent has to defend somehow so pins our knight to the bishop and adds an extra defender all right so castles bishop e6 now black brings three defenders now the defenders are the same it's the pieces that are attacking, right? So all of this is very simple. The plans are simple. That's why when we started, the author of the book said uh, the strategy to follow in this position again is isolated queen spawn are very simple. Just uh, remember to check with the tactics allow you to do uh, that strategy. So let's check quickly what move we are on. Uh, we are on move number 13. All right. So move number 13, bishop f3, bishop e6. Uh, okay, so let me ask you, it's your turn to play now. What would you play here in this position if you are white? So imagine this is your game. This is the last round of the tournament. If you win this game, you are going to win a prize money of 10,000 rands. And you have to come up with a plan to help you to win this game. What would you play now? So you have about one minute or so. You can raise a hand, please, so that we don't speak at once. If you can't raise a hand, just type in chat, raise hand. That's also fine. But it's easy to raise hand. The reactions there with that face, click there. It will show you the option to raise hand. Uh, anyone white to move what would you play here if this was your own game remembering we are focusing on a direct attack against the pawn so what would you play uh, Rowan I'd probably try and play like queen d2 and double up on the d file mm -hmm. Okay. Try and bring my f rook to the to d1 afterwards. Okay. Yeah, queen d2 was also suggested by Hana, Haga, and Jethro. Okay. Uh, but in the game, uh, queen d2 was not played. But it is it makes sense. Queen d2 makes sense because it is going to be preparing to attack the pawn, uh, which follows the plan. 
And there's no tactics to really uh, punish us at the moment uh, because we want to be uh, met with some crazy attack. But the plan was for, that was played was to exchange pieces first. Remember what we said, when you simplify pieces, uh, or in other words, when you exchange pieces in the isolated queen spawn position, you are going to have more pieces to attack and the opponent will have less pieces to, to defend uh, with. And also this bishop is very active. It was pinning our knight. So normally we don't want to remain under a pin for too long. So now we control, now, by the way, these plans work together. Just because the second plan says it's a direct attack against the isolated queen spawn, doesn't mean you forget the first plan, which was to control the square in front of it. So this is why queen d4 is necessary to prepare the other plan, which is to put pressure against the pawn. Now, a white, a black plays queen a5, knight to uh, d3, planning to jump to these squares. Now. This is the key thing about the isolated queen's pawn. There's always squares for the knights to jump next to it. That can uh, become very strong for our pieces. And now we are seeing that direct attack happen. White's plan is clear and all of the pieces are making movements to attack this pawn. So very, you see, step by step, just doing this point, a direct attack against the isolated queen's pawn. So that's what's happening here. Now the bishop tries to exchange. Of course, the opponent wants us to exchange. Why would it be bad for white to take on e4? Uh, Rowan, your hand is raised. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I forgot to lower it from the last side. But, that's uh, if if uh, white takes, black will recapture with the pawn, and his pawn is defended by the knight, and therefore you no longer have pressure on his on the isolated pawn. Yes, yes, right. If we take here, in fact, the opponent can just take away that isolated pawn. They remove it. Now we don't have an isolated pawn to attack anymore. It's now even a pawn that can be defended by another pawn. So that takes away our whole advantage. So white was not interested. Uh, Mr. Yusupov played here uh, rook d1 instead. So after rook d1, bishop takes f3, uh, g takes f3. Now, of course, black can say, aha, you see, now I have given you weaknesses also. Now this will be a very bonus uh, strategy tip. A weakness in chess is not a weakness if it cannot be attacked. Now I'll explain. By definition or by meaning, these pawns are weak pawns. They are, what do we call these two pawns on the F-file? Why do we call them weak pawns? And what are their names? Uh, Rowan? Uh, they doubled up pawns. Yes, double, uh, doubled pawns. Yeah, very correct. On the same file. When the two pawns are on the same file, they are called doubled pawns. Right, and this one is called an isolated pawn as we have been learning today. Now, by definition, these pawns are weak, but how can black attack these pawns? As we see right now, we can't even imagine how black can start to attack these pawns. So in chess, whenever you make weaknesses, try to make them away from the center because the weaknesses in the center are easy to attack than the weaknesses on the wing. If a weakness cannot be attacked, it's not really a weakness during that game. It might be in the book, but not in that game. Here, there is what this weakness is currently uh, under fire. These ones can't be attacked. So white is happy with that. So black adds another defender. The king goes to the side to prepare even for an attack against the king. Now, because we have taken with this pawn, we have created a half open file for the rook and rook, uh, rooks belong on half open files uh, and open files so that we will even threaten to win a piece for free. Uh, now after king h1. Yes, Hannah, Hannah and Jethro. You said, um, you said that the black the, the two pawns on the f file are 
they cannot be attacked. But can't Black do something like he put, he can move the knight to d7, then he put, he pushes the pawn to f6, then he moves the knight to e5, then he attacks the f3 pawn somewhere around there. Yes, a Black can do that, but whilst Black is doing that, Black will lose this pawn. So when I say they can't be attacked, I'm not saying there's no way to attack them. If you do that, you are going to be losing in the process. Does that make sense? So that's the point I'm trying to show you. Yes. Black and, yes. Okay, cool. So Black can find ways to attack these pawns, but he will lose in the process. So he doesn't have time to start an attack against this pawn, whilst he also has a very obvious pawn that's weak. Okay, let's move fast. Now there was a threat, of course. White was threatening to win this knight because of the absolute pin happening against this pawn. If black plays a steely move like this, we win a free knight, threatening checkmate as well. Black can't take here because mate ends the game. So black had to go back and defend this threat. Queen b6, now we can't take here anymore. Uh, the knight jumps, attacking the rook. The rook goes to c2. And now we go into the end game. We bring our king back because it's the end game. The king needs to be near the center. Uh, and now, of course, our opponent makes a threat. They were attacking our own pawn. So we jump with this knight, continuing with the same plan to attack that pawn on d5. Okay, Hannah, Jethro, and Haggai. Now, since like... Black has entered the end game. Can he try the plan, that plan of going for the F pawns? No, still they can't. Because if this knight moves, this pawn is going to be taken. So do you see that? Okay, let's move quickly. Uh, now here, white has a very easy end game. Uh, they sort of repeated moves to get time, because probably they were in time pressure. So normally top players repeat games to get time so that they can find the right plan. And now black has the right plan, uh, white has the right plan, sorry. And here, the same plan, block the square. Um, and finally, black did start an attack against the spawn, but white now has a pass pawn. Uh, so black's attack has not been successful. Because in the end game, the number one plan in the end game is to create a pass pawn. And white has done that. They now have a pass pawn. They need to push it. And this gives uh, white an advantage. Knight jumps to e4. Uh, king goes to e2, defending the pawn. So this is not really part of our lesson. White ended up losing this end game. Black ended up losing this end game. Uh, in fact, after knight... Um, Uh, knight to c3 check. Uh, the opponent resigned. Now, quickly, why did black resign after knight f3 check? Why did black resign? Because he won't be able to stop the pass pawn. Okay, uh, I'm not, who said that? Yeah, okay. No, that's not the reason. The reason was the knight is trapped. Notice how funny this is. The knight can't go anywhere. If your king moves here, oops, what is this? The knight has been trapped. That's why, listen up, people. Knights don't go on the edge of the board. The knight on the edge is green. Don't put the knight on the edge for no reason. You can quickly lose it out of nowhere. And that's why black resigned because they will lose a free knight and white is an isolated a pass pawn. Uh, this is an isolated pawn, but it's a pass pawn in the end game outside, whilst it's defended by the knight and will be up with a knight. So that was the other plan with uh, a direct attack. And now the last one we are going to cover uh, change in the pawn structure. So this just means. The, the structure will change from one structure to the other where someone who have an isolated pawn 
but then we'll change it and no one, they won't have it anymore, but we'll get an advantage because of that. So let's see how this happened. So this game was played by two uh, big powerhouses, Akiba Rubenstein, one of the greatest players of the end game to ever play in, in the game of chess. If you want to learn chess end games, go and find the games of Akiba Rubenstein. Right, and of course we have Emmanuel Alaska. Who is Emmanuel Alaska? Who is Emmanuel Alaska? Emmanuel Alaska was Emmanuel Alaska, um, a world champion, like who was a world champion for a long time, a really long time. That is true. Emmanuel Alaska is the longest world champion in the history of chess. He was world champion for 26 years and some 300 and something days, almost 27 years. So he is the longest running world champion. Uh, he is the player who said this famous saying that you hear many chess coaches and many uh, YouTube videos. If you find a good move, find a better move. Now we see why he said that. He was a world champion for 26 years and 300 something days. Clearly, he didn't just say that, he was doing it in this game. So let us see quickly the game that he played against Akiba Rubenstein. So we are going to see now it has appeared. This is our subject. We see it on the board, the isolated queen's pawn. Black, uh, white has an isolated queen's pawn. And now, uh, let's throw in, please mute. Right. So here in this uh, position, now that we've learned a little bit about playing against a isolated queen's pawn, let's just find someone to give us a plan for blank. What would you play here with blank? What would you do now? What would you do? What would what what move would you play in this position? Anyone wants to give uh, Rowan? I would play knight f6. Knight f6, uh, okay. Why would you because play knight f6? No, sorry. It firstly controls the d5 square in front of the pawn. And yeah. well, if white gives me another turn, I can play knight to d5. If yeah. white decides to exchange knights, it, it firstly helps with the exchanges as well as the bishop can recapture and then add more pressure to the d uh d4 pawn so exchanging i think would be beneficial for for black as well as having the knight control of pawn in front uh, the square in front is beneficial for for black no oh, wonderful thank you uh, brooklyn yes brooklyn your, your hand is raised I would play knight b6, preparing to play knight d5. Okay, thank you. So in the game, uh, rook c8 was played instead, which is a very strange move. <laughs> it sort of goes against what we have been talking about, but I'll explain why this move. This move was played right now. This pawn can't move anywhere. We are controlling the square in front of it. So we are following that plan at least. But also, we want to make sure the opponent doesn't have active pieces. This rook is on an open file, and rooks belong on open files. And when the opponent is controlling an open file, we want to challenge the open file. And we put this rook here so we can bring the other rook on the D file, so that if the opponent exchanges, we also get the plan of exchanging the pieces so that we can put pressure. So basically, that was one of the plans. And now you see it, the rook arrives here anyways, so that if they take, we'll exchange pieces. Uh, so now they took the rook, we take the open file. 
And we are happy with these exchanges. We are very happy with these exchanges because they are allowing us to have potentially more pieces attacking and making sure their pieces are going to be a passive. So h6 stopping any knight jump or the bishop going here. The bishop comes back and now the knight b6 that uh, Brooklyn suggested to bring the knight to d5. And now the queen takes the open file, keep the pieces active. One of the main things in strategy is keep your pieces active. That's very important. So the queen goes to d3, knight to d5, a3. And now we are going to see the change of the pawns uh, soon. So we have gone into an end game and now the, the pawn structure sort of uh, hasn't changed yet. It's still the same, uh, but we ended up winning uh, the, pawn, the, the pawn. And now in the end, this issue of the isolated pawn, here, this is where maybe they wanted to hint the change of the pawn structure, but in truth, the pawns were the same. It's two versus two. This is what they mean by pawn structure. Currently, there are four pawns here versus three pawns. And there is one pawn in the center versus our pawn, which is the isolated pawn, two versus two, which means we have the same pawns there. So why is it important about the, so that I pick it up, the pawn structure? When the pawn structure is different, we can create a pass pawn. Because remember what we said, the number one plan in the end game is you must create a pass pawn. So when you want to change the pawn structure, you want to make sure you have a chance to create a pass pawn. So that's basically what happened here. Uh, the opponent, uh, I mean, honestly, just lost the pawn here. And after this, they are just losing. They have two weaknesses now. They have an isolated pawn and we have a uh, pass pawn on the outside rank. And this is now just a lost position. Now, finally, we see the pawn structure has changed. There is four on this side, on the king side, and there's one versus zero. We have an extra pawn, uh, extra pawn and we are going to be winning because the pass pawn has been created. So that's basically the point here to remember. When it says the change of pawn structure, make sure you find a way to create a pass pawn if you go into this end game. So the rest of the game is not very interesting. It was just a nice end game. Uh, where the opponent ended up resigning at some point. Uh, and yeah, here the opponent uh, resigned. So anyone wants to tell me why they resigned in this position? Well, there are two hands raised. Now when your hand is ahead, why did the white resign here? Sorry, I didn't realize my hand was raised. I'm still calculating. <laughs> okay, uh, Br Brooklyn, why do you think White resigned now? I'm still calculating, sir. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, but because of time, uh, I think uh, the reason why White is resigning is this bishop can't move anywhere. The bishop is a very passive piece. Only the king can move. Uh, and if the king moves here uh, also it's going nowhere because it, it will take forever for the king to sorry it will take forever for the king to attack uh to attack the pawn on f7 and by that point our plan of course should be to win this bishop and make sure we are going to be uh, queening that pawn so if white would have played here so what was so uh, embarrassing for him that he resigned? Uh, well, to be fair, it's not very clear. It's going to lose, sure, but he probably could have played on a bit. Because knight here, it might get dangerous with the king going here. Because these pawns, once the opponent takes these pawns, uh, we might not be happy with that. Uh, but yeah, maybe just go for the pawns, for the bishop, I mean. Looks a bit dangerous, but yeah, it's winning. Yeah, that's the point. The knight is going to be in time. The king is too slow. Now, yeah, that's the reason. 
So Gurukul in your hand was raised now. Uh, did you find this idea? Yeah, similar. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's the idea. The idea is that uh, if the king goes for this pawns, uh, we are going to go for the bishop, right? We'll go for the bishop. Uh, but of course, if the bishop keeps running away, still we are going to win the bishop. If the king goes here, now we can play this move. Then we make a queen. The king takes. Well, if you take, you lose the game. So you must take the first. King takes. The point is this. Uh, is that now we are going to be defending the two pawns. Still a bit messy, honestly. After this. Yeah. Okay, since our clearly our human being, uh, our human minds are being limited here, because I don't think this position is losing the name. It looks too, our king is too far away. Yeah, can't be losing. So why was he resigning here? What was the plan? Well, apparently king e4, but I was just thinking, what exactly are you going to be doing if I just go for this pawns? Oh, okay, make another pass for okay. <laughs> yeah, the computer just shows us we are not very good after all. Uh, yeah, well, they, because there's no way to win by this pawn alone. This pawn is one advantage. And in endgame, in chess, there is what is called the principle of two weaknesses. It's not enough for the opponent to lose when they have one weakness. You need to create a second weakness. So now after this, now you have a second weakness and you are going to be winning. Because after this check, this is nothing. You can just go here. Now you have a second weakness. And now definitely they can resign. And they have a bad king. So he resigned very early, of course. But yeah, as a strong endgame player, he probably had analyzed everything and realized that he's going to be too slow. So he gave up. Okay, so that was the whole point of the isolated pawn against it. The disadvantages. So we are going to just uh, cover a few of the attacking ones. I feel like the attacking ones are easier to learn than the uh, against ones. So, but before we move on, do we have any questions about how to play against an isolated queen spawn? Any question or comments about the first portion? So we have done this now. Uh, is there any questions about this part? Okay, I hear no questions. Let's move on. Uh, the benefits of playing with an isolated pawn or the advantages. Number one, breakthrough in the center. So we are going to be taking the game. Uh, we won't look at all of the games. We'll only look at one. The rest, feel free, please. The lesson plan will be sent to you. You can go through the, the games. There is also exercises that I put on a leech study of the same topic so that you make sure that what you have learned, you are using it and it becomes part of your knowledge. Just sitting here for one hour and 30 minutes won't make you a, a strategy master. You must do these things yourself so that they can really sit in your head. Uh, don't worry, uh, Hannah, Hega and Jethro, the study they will share with you. Uh, I have sent it in, so they will share it on the group, I believe. Okay, it's the study is called the City Cape Town Chess Academy Isolated Queen's Farm uh, Advantages and Disadvantages. Uh, probably I'm using different words, but that's the name. But everything they'll give it to you. All right, so quickly let us learn about the advantages. Number one, the the advantages of okay. That the advantages of an isolated queen spawn, number one, is that you are going to be controlling the c5 and e5 squares with your pawn, right? Which means, or if you are playing black, you'll be controlling c4 and e4. Because I'll show a diagram so that we don't just talk about words. So if you have an isolated queen spawn, 
one of the advantages is that it controls these squares, right? If you are white, it controls E5 and C5. If you're black, it controls C4 and E4. This means your knight especially can go to these squares and have very good uh, squares. Uh, it gives an advantage in the center. Now, the other plan is that, the other advantage is that you have a semi-open file or a half-open file. Because the pawn is isolated, there's going to be a half-open file uh, for your rooks and your queens uh, on the E file and the C file. And we can put our pieces behind the pawn to prepare an attack against the opponent's king. There are three main plans to use when you are the one with an isolated queen's pawn. Number one, you need to break through in the center. Uh, number one is you need to break through in the center. Someone is writing on the board. Please don't write. Uh, number one, you need to break through in the center. And number two, you need to attack on the king's side. And number three, attack on the queen side. Those are the three plans. I'll take them up again. Number one, a breakthrough in the center. Number two, attacking on the king side. And number three, attacking on the queen side. So this is what you need to know when you have the isolated queen's pawn. Quickly, let's move. Number one, we are going to look at the game. Tigran Petrosian, the chess tiger, right? Former world chess champion, very, very strong player. Our amazing player with strategy. This game was played in um, 1974 in USSR, uh, which is the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union. So the game began, C4. We'll play through the opening quite quickly. Because we just want to see the plans in action. So uh, uh, the plan you have to look out for here is the breakthrough in the center, which means you are going to push this pawn at the right moment. That's what it means. So let's see it happen. And now, one of the key plans of the isolated queen's pawn is the king side attack. Attacking on the king side is one of your main plans with the queen side pawn, uh, isolated pawn, because your pieces can play behind this pawn. This pawn has, uh, has given you what is called in chess space advantage. The pawn is on the fourth rank. That is the most forward pawn. So that means white has space advantage, especially in the center, which means you have room to maneuver your pieces or plan strategy behind the pawn. So that's one of the advantages of the IQP. Now the rook goes on the C file and we can see it now, this plan. We are threatening checkmate. If this knight falls asleep, we can win the game very quickly. So, of course, the opponent won't blunder. Now there is the breakthrough. The breakthrough, we, this is an important thing. Whenever you get the chance to break through, you should take it. Because this pawn, as you saw the first part of the, the lectern, it can become a real weakness if it stays there. So, that's where the plan of the breakthrough in the center comes from. Now, the point is, of course, uh, we are going to be attacking this knight, which is defending this, uh, this pawn. And the knight cannot move really because there's checkmate in two. Uh, if the knight jumps in the center, we take back our pawn. So that's what happened. The knight jumps in the center, we win the pawn back. And now we don't have that isolated pawn anymore. What has happened? It's gone. We don't have any weaknesses anymore. And now it is white who has an advantage because we have the same pawns on both sides, which is what is called in chess a symmetrical position. And the main plan when the pawns are the same is to have active pieces. And white pieces are very active, very, very active. So white is a clear advantage and white went on to win the game quite easily because of the superior active uh, pieces they have. And uh, of course there was a threat. Now, what would you have played if black had played a six now? or even a, a decent move. If black had played knight to uh, a5, what would you have played, Rowan? Queen takes c6, check. Uh, sorry, you said? Queen takes g6, 
check. Very good. The F4 is turned. And this is also a lost position at the same time. The king must move to the corner, otherwise it's mate. If the king goes here, oops, checkmate ends the game. Uh, so the only correct move is to go here, and after check, it's just, it resigns. It's even, yeah, it just resigns. Right. Oops, checkmate ends the game. Right, so it's very dangerous already now. So that's the point of breaking through with the center. You get rid of the weakness, and you have a very active position. And yeah, of course, there was even a sacrifice of a knight because the opponent's king is very exposed. There is a threat. Black species are too passive. They're not doing anything uh, active here. And uh, it was a very instructional game. There is a reason why this man was nicknamed the chess tiger because of this reason. He was a positional chess player but when he attacked, it was always special. The game is remembered forever because how special the power of the attack is. These attack, when a positional player or a player who uses strategy attacks, they always win because they will attack from a, from a better position. Every piece is in the right square. So the attack cannot be defended. You are going to lose in short. So that's basically what happened. We'll stop here because of time. Uh, we have just shown at least a picture of what uh, uh, happened. In the end, white won a pawn. Uh, in fact, the, the opponent resigned after h4. So <laughs> we don't even need to stop here. The opponent resigned. They are down with the pawn. The bishop is pinned against the rook. There is a threat of rook check, rook f4 check, just losing everything. So the opponent has seen enough. Uh, and even if we exchange pieces, we are going to be, uh, I mean, what can Blank do really? Probably this is the only thing that Blank can do, but oops. Yeah, no. At best, we are going to be winning material, but even not that check is coming. This, there needs to be some decision here. Where is the king going to go? The king can't go anywhere except here. Again, there's also knight e7, uh, knight e5 check. Yeah. Even this is enough. The opponent can start to cry after rook g7. Uh, there's the threat against the, you are losing a piece here. Right, so they resign. So that's basically the idea of breakthrough with the center. You break through the center so your pieces can have active moves and you are overwhelming the opponent with your active pieces. And again, the second game, you can look at it yourself and enjoy all these things in detail uh, by doing them yourself. Now, we are going to look at the next game. Again, Powerhouse, former world champion, Mikhail Hubotvinik, uh, who started the Botvinik chess school that Gary Kasparov and Anatoly Kapov went to, and they both became world champion. And if I might say, two of the greatest world champions in the history of chess. So this is the man who uh, started the school that they were trained at. He was a very powerful attacking plan. So the second plan we are following is king side attack. So the king side attack tells you what you are going to be doing. You are going to be trying to bring your pieces to attack. Now listen, earlier on we learned that if you are playing against the isolated pink spawn, you need to exchange pieces but when you are the one with the isolating spawn, try as much as possible to keep the pieces on the board so that when the time to attack comes, your pieces are more active. Uh, if I'm going too fast, please let me know if you have any questions or comments so that we don't leave anyone behind. Is there any questions so far on the things that have been covered? Okay, bueno is the Spanish would say, good. Right, let's continue. So we are, and now that's to that point we were saying, the advantage of an isolated pawn is it controls the center squares E5 and C5. So we can use it for our knights to occupy the center. In other words, to put them in the center. Now here we exchange this bishop and uh, we are going to be preparing to activate the pieces. The rooks are coming in there will be all sorts of threats uh, that will be shown very soon. 
the threat of course is to break through in the center here to get rid of the pawn so that needs to be stopped uh, so the opponent prepares to stop that and now of course the king side that attack why is knight f7 working why is knight f7 working why would he sacrifice his knight for a pawn Bowen? because uh both the bishop and the queen are on um e6 so if the rook captures you can capture with the bishop pinning the rook as well as hitting the rook on c8 um if he decides to capture with the king you can always go with the queen and then that's going to be a very deadly attack yes right the king is going to be very exposed it will be uh it will be game over soon after check the king must stay in the center and but how do you continue this did you see what you do after queen takes king e8 rowan yes what would you play now after king e8 you can also play d5 yeah you can also play d5 that's fine, but this is a bit slow. Then you can pee in like bishop a4. Exactly, right? The opponent is in trouble here. Their pieces are just misplaced. And uh, this time it's enough to, to decide, of course. Okay, so that's why uh, this move works because the tactics are supporting it. Uh, this is not the line that was played in the game. Queen e6, the opponent took with the rook in the game. Uh, after the king defends the rook, we bring the knight in the center to bring more pressure against the rook. The opponent exchanges, we are bringing this rook into the seventh rank, attacking the pieces. And after the knight blocks the first pawn, now we put our knight putting pressure on both of the squares. Uh, and yeah, black. Uh, now the opponent won back their piece and even the game by simply attacking the king on the king side because their pieces were more active and their pieces were aiming at the king side, particularly the f7 square, which was very weak. Uh, and here the game, of course, the opponent resigned. After this, you lose. So the only way to continue the game is to take, but even this is hopeless. The pawn is hanging, there's a threat to win the bishop. You can't defend two threats at the same time. Uh, black had seen enough, black resigned. Uh, Hannah, Haggai, Jethro. Please may go back a few moves. Okay. Somewhere around there when he takes the knight, when he's finished taking the knight and he's spin. Oh, okay, like here. Yes, somewhere there. Can the black bishop can the black bishop come to d5? Yes, that is correct. You can go to d5. But this yes. end game is going to be losing after takes. This is the point. Uh, the end game, we are up with two pawns. And we have a pass pawn in the end game. Oh, okay. right. So it will be lost. But very good point. Well done. Okay, last game we are going to look at is the plan on the queen side. So the plan on the queen side is to attack the weak squares. That will happen on the queen side. That's the plan. The plan on the queen side is you are trying to force black or whoever has the isolate, who doesn't have the isolate upon, to have weaknesses. And we say that's why it was important to know this meaning. A weak square. Well, we didn't actually put the weak square. We need to know what is a weak square. Um, anyone, what is a weak square? I know. Yes. A weak square is a square that is not protected by a pawn. Very good, Takuz. A weak square is a square that cannot be defended by a pawn. So that's the plan in the queen side play, is find the weak squares on the queen side 
and use them to put your pieces there. So that's basically what you're going to be trying to do. And the weak squares are clear, B5, D6, E5. D6 is a weak square, no pawn can defend D6. So we are going to plan to attack that square. Uh, the opponent exchanged the pieces, which they should, because they need to. Now, of course, why was it a mistake for the queen to take on F3? Okay, Hannah, Ega, Jethro, your hand is raised. Why is it a mistake? Okay, Rowan, why is it a mistake? Because the queen is defending the c4 bishop. If queen takes, rook takes c4. Correct. The queen is now overloaded. It can't do two things at the same time. It will lose the piece. So that's why we took. And now again, as I say, these pawns are weak, but it's more difficult for black to attack these pawns than for white to attack uh, this pawn on a7. Just by one move already, we can attack it. Right? So after knight h5, we start, this is what we mean. The queen side plan, quickly, attack on the queen side. You are attacking the weak squares, the squares that cannot be protected by pawns. You want to put your pieces there, the knight, the bishop, and bring the rook inside uh, into the seventh rank. So we'll see that play out uh, very nicely. And here, look at those pieces. Again, World champion Anatoly Kapov uh, shows us how to do this. Uh, and he does it very well. Wins a pawn for nothing. Uh, they, and here, they are not, he's not going to lose a piece because the queen is defending. So if our opponent thinks they are clever, we can simply retreat by playing knight to c6 because the queen cannot take because we are going to take it. So now that's the basically the attacking on the queen side. You are going to attack the weak squares. Uh, now the rook goes on the seventh rank, which is a weak square here. And uh, black just has a lost position on the queen side. Black uh, has nothing to do. And now white even gets rid of their isolated pawn. White doesn't even have an isolated pawn anymore. And the opponent uh, is down with the pawn. So the rest of the game is not too interesting. White won quite nicely with a nice sacrifice uh, that will lead to checkmate. So the opponent, of course, took the rook and said, prove to me you are winning. So let's see why it was winning. Now the opponent resigned here. Quickly, someone tell me, why did they resign? Okay, Hannah, Hakai, Jethro, your hand is raised. Um, okay, Brooklyn, go ahead, please. Because when he plays, if black plays king e7, you, you can play queen g7 check, and then you prepare the, to play the bishop, the white bishop, on b5 All since right. the pawn the pawn on e is guarding d6 and f6 okay. all right thanks uh brooklyn sorry Rowan. yeah Rowan, go ahead uh, Anna and Haga, please wait okay um if if king to, to e8 it's bishop g6 check uh king e7 queen g7 mate and if it's mm -hmm. king g7, it's queen g7, check and king e8 and bishop g6, mate. Very good. Well done. Uh, thanks, Brooklyn. Rowan, Anna, Hakai, Jethro. Mm, that, was, that was what we were going to say. Okay. No, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. So we, we finish right on time. Thank you so much. Is there any questions before I go? Okay, no questions. The material, the Michael who ends the. Stuff. I have a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Wh which opening is like the best to use an isolated queen spawn? Usually the d4 pawn opening, d4, d5. That's usually the one. But yeah, oh. normally if you want to get it, you need to learn to play d4. That's where you can get an isolated queen spawn a lot. But also, 
in E4, you can get isolated pawns. Like in the French defense, you can get an isolated pawn. But mainly the D4 opening is the one to get an isolated king's pawn. Or C4, no, okay. but usually with D4. Okay, thank you. Very good. Okay, uh, I'll hand over to Michael. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. It was fun. I hope that you've been inspired to go and go through the material that you receive and yeah as always keep chasing bye-bye thank you very much for the session dion i will share that material on the whatsapp group in like a few minutes but yeah y'all, thank you everyone for coming and have a good evening thanks have a thank good you evening, you're welcome bye. Bye -bye. thank you bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.